Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters today. They are from the Appalachian Perina uh, Perinatal Mental Health Alliance. The Appalachian Perinatal Mental Health Alliance is a regional nonprofit under Postpartum Support International. Their regional mission is to increase the community's capacity to meet the needs of families impacted by perinatal mental health concerns through promoting workforce development in trauma-informed, culturally competent perinatal mental health practice, serving as the hub for perinatal mental health resources in the Appalachian Highlands, coordinating with systems serving perinatal populations to help promote the consumer's awareness of perinatal of perinatal mental health concerns and resources. Our primary speaker today is Dr. Diana Moreland, who is a licensed clinical psychologist at the ETSU Department of Psychology and is the current president of the Appalachian Perinatal Mental Health Alliance. Dr. Moreland will introduce her colleagues as they move through their presentation. Without further ado, we welcome Dr. Moreland. Thank you, Dr. Jensen, and I apologize for giving you such a mouthful of an introduction, but we're really excited to share what we're doing with the Appalachian Perinatal Mental Health Alliance, so thanks for that. We're happy to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Head nods if you can see it. Wonderful. So the title of our talk today is It Takes a Village, Community-Based Practices to Assess and Treat Mental Health Difficulties During Pregnancy and Postpartum. We have nothing to disclose. And I won't reread this slide um, because Dr. Jensen said, did such a great job of explaining who we are. Um, I do want to note that we're really a nonprofit that is aimed at not only raising awareness about mental health issues during pregnancy and postpartum um, and decreasing the stigma, but really what we're doing um, here in the Appalachian Highlands is working to increase our community's capacity to meet the needs of those impacted by perinatal mental health problems. So really systems level work of bringing together um, all of the people who touch the lives of pregnant women, um, postpartum women, young children, families, et cetera. So to help kind of show that a little bit, I wanted to explain a little bit about who's involved in the Appalachian Perinatal Mental Health Alliance. So you can see um, the circles around um, kind of show who's represented um, on our board and, and who's, who's helping us think through these, these issues related to raising awareness, decreasing stigma, and in increasing our community's capacity to meet the needs. And then the black squares indicate who's, who's talking to you today. Um, so I will, I will share that we've got um, survivors, so mamas who've been had their own lived experience of perinatal mental health struggles. We have folks working in pediatrics, social work, psychology, counseling, public health folks, um, our OB folks, nursing, midwifery, lactation, population health level folks, community mental health, um, other nonprofits in our region. And, and then you can see that circle that has the question marks and that's kind of who's missing. Um, and one of the things you might not see there is psychiatry. So we're really excited today to share with you more about this and to think through how we can continue to build these bridges and, um, and work together to meet the needs of our community. And so on today's talk, you have a psychologist, a pediatrician, a behavioral health consultant in PEDS, um, a few mamas with lived experience of perinatal mental health difficulties, and I forgot the nursing box, a nurse, and um, some folks doing nonprofit work. So you've got a nice representation today. I would love to hear a little bit about who's in the room. Um, and so if you are willing and able, I'll ask that um, you put in the chat box your your years of practice or training in psychiatry. And if you're not a psychiatrist, that's okay. I'd love to hear what field you're in. Um, so years of practice or training in psychiatry. And if you're not a psych psychiatry person, just tell me what field you are in. Um, if it's relevant, your estimated percentage of patient population that you've worked with thus far in your career who has been pregnant or postpartum, um, and then any specific questions you'd like us to hold in mind as we move through our time together today. So again, use the chat box. Tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do, if you work with perinatal populations. Sounds like we've got several residents, ranging from year one to four. Of those residents, I'm curious if you've, if you've seen any 
perinatal patients. Dr. Miller, yes, I imagine you've seen quite a few. Glad you're on this call, eager to have your thoughts. Dr. J. Shanker, yes, pediatrician. And yeah, you get a, a large population with perinatal mamas. I'm excited for you all to share what you're doing in peds to meet those needs. We've got attendings on residents, 10 years, lots of range, some teen moms, all right. Hello, Dr. Mosier, yes, child clinical psychologist, Infant Mental Health Association, that's right. All right, I appreciate all of this information about who's on the call. Wonderful, about 10% reproductive related. All right, thanks. Keep it coming. I'll keep an eye on the chat box. Also those questions of maybe what you're hoping we'll talk about or what questions you have when you think about perinatal mental health. We recognize for our psychiatrist colleagues on this call that you all are experts in mental health. So we're not here to talk to you about what mental health is as much as how to think about um, the unique challenges and considerations related to the perinatal period, as well as an interdisciplinary approach to um, meeting the needs of our perinatal mental health community. So some quick numbers. Um, I think it's always helpful to get regrounded in, in the prevalence rates and kind of how common things are. Um, we know that one in five women will experience a mental health condition during pregnancy or the first year postpartum. Um, about 75% of women who experience maternal mental health difficulties are, and symptoms will go untreated. And the cost of not treating maternal mental health conditions is about $14 billion annually. Um, and so really recognizing um, that this is a big problem. It's very common. It's uncommon for, for women to get the treatment they need. Um, and there is a big societal cost. And we'll talk more about the impact of the mom and the, the baby and the bonding level as well. Also, I want to clarify, I'm going to use the word perinatal mental health a lot, but there's other words out there that folks are using. When I say perinatal, I mean pregnancy up to one year postpartum. All right. Um, of the women who experience anxiety or depression during pregnancy or the first year of their life, this is a breakdown of when they tend to experience it. So about 27% go into pregnancy with anxiety or depression. About a third develop those symptoms during pregnancy and about 40% develop those symptoms postpartum. So just really representing, I mean, it's almost a third in each category um, that it's not just the postpartum period, which I think historically we hear a lot about postpartum depression, but really recognizing pregnancy as a time of greater risk um, for all women, especially those women with a history of mental health conditions. And let's not forget our dads or our co-parents and partners. Um, so there's some emerging literature that's looking more at this and, and saying that about one in 10 dads will experience some postnatal depression as well. All right, I know this is a busy slide. I'm gonna stay here for a minute, so don't fret. We'll also share these slides um, with you at the end if, you, if you're interested. I've got some citations there if you wanna look into these things. But what I wanted to do with this is just again, reground us in how common these things are to help us understand how often you might be seeing these difficulties. On the left-hand side, you'll see that I just put perinatal mental health, also sometimes called maternal mental health, and sometimes called perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, or PMADs. So that's just all different jargon, often referring to the same thing. Um, and I kind of went semi in the order of severity. It's, it's not a scientific classification, but at the top we've got our baby blues, um, which I'm sure most of you know are relatively common. A majority of women will experience the baby blues. This is that tearfulness, um, sadness, some emotional ability um, that we really tend to see emerge in the first few weeks postpartum and really should be going away um, by three to four weeks postpartum. Um, so that's pretty common um, and that's not to be confused with postpartum depression or perinatal depression. Um, and this is more of our clinically significant major depressive disorder symptoms that we see during pregnancy or postpartum. And about one in four women will have symptoms of depression in pregnancy and postpartum. And about 10 to 15% of women will develop clinically significant depression during their pregnancy or postpartum. Now, any of you who do, um, who are looking to the literature to get prevalence rates know how much these rates vary. Um, so that's why you'll see big ranges, but I did try to turn to the meta-analyses to really find some um, 
more solid confidence intervals when it comes to these rates. Then when we look at our anxiety disorders, about 10 to 20% of women will experience clinically significant anxiety during pregnancy or postpartum. Um, and I, I pulled out, I didn't go by anxiety disorder, but I did pull out panic disorder because panic disorder is one of the disorders where the prevalence rate during the perinatal period is higher than the prevalence rate for women during their lifetime. So the, the most likely time a woman is to have panic disorder is during pregnancy or postpartum. So just wanted to highlight that additional risk. Then we've got obsessive compulsive disorder. This is our other perinatal mental health disorder where the point prevalence during pregnancy and postpartum is higher than what it is for a lifetime of a woman. So the highest risk she has for developing OCD is during pregnancy or postpartum. We see prevalence rates from about two to 5% in pregnant and postpartum women. Of the women who develop perinatal OCD, um, about 13 to 39% um, will have their first onset of OCD symptoms during pregnancy. Um, so that it's really kind of, starting to emerge during pregnancy and then the others will kind of develop it postpartum. Um, and about a third of women will experience subclinical um, obsessive or compulsive symptoms during that perinatal period. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, this is another one that I feel like we're continuing to learn more about. Um, so when you think about the general population of perinatal women, about 3% will meet criteria for PTSD during pregnancy or postpartum. That rate is ex exponentially higher in our mamas who have been deemed high risk. So these are our mamas of color, um, our mamas with sociodemographic risks, such as low educational attainment, low income, um, and our mamas with childhood maltreatment history or a history of adverse childhood experiences. And then a unique type of PTSD is following a traumatic birth. So approximately 9% of mamas who identify that their birth experience was traumatic will develop PTSD following that traumatic birth experience. Uh, and then finally, our most rare and most severe form of perinatal mental health is postpartum psychosis. Um, the prevalence rates here are one to two women out of every 1,000. Most cases will present within the first four weeks postpartum, but that is not always the case. Um, and then within that kind of highest risk group for postpartum psychosis, we see the suicide rate for women diagnosed with postpartum psychosis is 5% and and 1% is the infanticide rate where a mama ends up um, killing her baby. And I put those there because I think when we think postpartum psychosis, hopefully we're thinking mental health crisis, something needs to happen immediately. Um, mama's probably gonna need hospitalized and some medication. And I think the media really shows the worst case scenarios with our postpartum psychosis cases. And so just remembering that it's actually pretty rare for our postpartum psychosis mamas to end up killing themselves or killing their babies. Those are the cases that make it to the news, make it to our memories. However, it is rare and yet it's still a risk that's higher um, in that time. So it's, it's severe, we should take it seriously, and also we should be mindful that just what we see in the media is not necessarily what is representative of what's happening. Again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit with risk factors. A lot of the risk factors for perinatal mental health struggles are the same risk factors we see for a lot of our mental health difficulties. However, there are a few I want to zoom in on related to pregnancy. Um, so things like an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy, um, gender disappointment. This is one I don't think we talk about much where uh, mama maybe really wanted um, a girl and is pregnant with a boy or vice versa. Um, so that putting a mama at greater risk for experiencing some mental health struggles during pregnancy. Um, a challenging pregnancy, so a, a um, high risk pregnancy puts a mama at, a physically high risk pregnancy puts a mama at higher risk for mental health struggles. Um, Others, I mean, I think you all recognize the hormonal changes that are happening during pregnancy and postpartum absolutely play into the greater rates of mental health difficulties during that time. And one thing we're getting um, more research done on is that women who have um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder um, before they're pregnant are at greater risk 
um, for developing mood or anxiety symptoms during pregnancy or postpartum. And then all of this to say that in the context of sociodemographic risk, so our health disparities lens, um, the risk rates just go up exponentially. So women living in poverty, women of color are more likely to experience perinatal mental health difficulties and less likely to get help. Um, and this is Y'all yeah, know, it's a very complex problem. It's so important to be aware of it. Um, and some of the reasons why we see these higher rates of mental health difficulties and these lower rates of getting help are related to access to healthcare, um, cultural and racial biases in the healthcare system, more barriers to care, um, and then unique fears related to um, certain subgroups of mamas related to child protective services or immigration agencies becoming involved. So just being aware of that, and I think all of us are. Um, you know, ethically called to do our work to promote um, equity in access to care and help to minimize these health disparities that we see so much in our nation. In terms of impact of perinatal um, mental health difficulties, I broke it down by the impact to the mama, the impact to the baby, and the impact to the relationship. So at the top, you'll see the impact to the mama. So mamas with mental health difficulties um, are more likely to get poorer prenatal care um, or start prenatal care later, poor, have poor nutrition and weight gain, use substances during pregnancy, experience physical, sexual, and or emotional abuse during that perinatal period, and experience pregnancy complications such as preeclampsia or gestational diabetes. Babies born to mamas with perinatal mental health difficulties are more likely to have lower birth weight, have preterm birth, longer NICU stays, excessive crying, and be classified as having a difficult temperament, and then have behavioral, cognitive, and or emotional delays um, in that early childhood period. And then relationally, um, I'm an infant mental health person, which means I believe there's no such thing as a baby. There's a baby and a mama. There's no such thing as a mama without a baby. It's the relationship. It's the dyad that's so important, especially to, um, we know now more than ever, that safe nurturing relationships are crucial to children's development. Um, and perinatal mental health difficulties impact the relationship, not surprisingly. We see impaired bonding, more breastfeeding and feeding challenges, more difficult interactions between mom and baby, kind of in both directions, which you can imagine just kind of exacerbates and creates the cycle. Um, low maternal patience and empathy, and more harsh or withdrawn parenting styles. Maternal suicide um, is one of the leading causes of maternal death in the US and the leading cause of death in other countries. Um, this is coming from 2020 Mom, which is a nonprofit organization that does a lot around maternal mental health awareness and policy. So I encourage you to check out their website. Um, the highest risk for maternal suicide occurs at nine to 12 months postpartum. Um, so thinking about like the DSM, for example, and how they're, they just with DSM-5 to move from a postpartum designation to a peri, I think they call it perinatal, peripartum. Somebody can put it in the chat box if they know the actual wording. Um, but recognizing both the pregnancy period as a greater risk. But DSM ends that postpartum period at four weeks. And we know that postpartum doesn't end at four weeks. Um, and, and I think it's really important to know that um, maternal suicide risk is higher um, really later in that postpartum period, so that nine to 12 months. And some of the risk factors for maternal suicide, again, I think y'all know the risk factors for suicide in general, but related to maternal suicide in that postpartum period, sleep disturbances makes sense. <laughs> There's a newborn baby. Um, but recognizing how important sleep is for mental health and mood stability, um, depression, anxiety, postpartum psychosis, again, that kind of exponentially increases the risk, and bipolar disorder, which we often see postpartum psychosis and bipolar disorder um, having some underlying etiology, and a previous bipolar disorder puts mom at greater risk for postpartum psychosis. Of note, if you wanna get involved at the policy level, the US does not currently require states to report maternal suicide rates. So it's actually really hard to get rates of um, maternal suicide during that perinatal period um, because we aren't systematically documenting it as a nation. Um, I did do some research, you can see, again, I'll share these slides so you have the references, but 
In terms of scary thoughts, almost all mamas will have some kind of scary intrusive thoughts in the postpartum period. Um, there's some cool uh, kind of neuroimaging science out there related to how um, parts of our brains kind of related to OCD and that obsessive compulsive responding um, are more active in the postpartum period. It's a protective effect to be thinking about your baby, be worried about your baby. Um, and, and so for the majority of mamas, we see um, that they'll report at least having some kind of scary thought of like, I, I think about dropping the baby or I think about throwing the baby or um, I think about driving the car off off the cliff and just like these like intrusive thoughts and what's different about intrusive thoughts and suicidal ideation is the intrusive thoughts are um, distressing to the mom. It's this, it's this notion of like, I see myself throwing the baby and then I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I having this thought that I'm going to throw my baby against the wall or drop my baby down the stairs? Um, and so those intrusive thoughts are really common and they, the mom is aware that they're kind of bizarre um, and they cause the mom a little distress. And so it's, I think it's really important for all of us to know that this is common and to help normalize it. Um, of course, if it starts to transition into more um, consistent, frequent, and impairing intrusive thoughts, then we're gonna be thinking about postpartum OCD. Um, but just recognizing the experience of having intrusive thoughts is something that's relatively common. In terms of suicidal ideation, so actually having thoughts that I want to kill myself um, or, or harm myself, about 15 to 33% of women will report those. It's probably an underestimate because it's hard for mamas to report on those things because they're scared of what's going to happen if they answer those questions. Um, and then suicide rates in the postpartum period. Again, the U.S. does not currently report national maternal suicide rates, but it does account for up to 20% of maternal deaths in that postpartum period, so a major problem. And then I, again, I'm preaching to the choir here and I'm going over on time, so I'm gonna keep this quick, but in thinking about talking to women in the perinatal period about their, about their mood, about their symptoms, and especially about suicidal thoughts or intrusive thoughts, I think it's so important for all of us to recognize the importance of creating a psychologically safe space in which we're having those conversations. Um, for my psychiatry colleagues, y'all are experts in this. How do we create a safe and validating space um, in which we can talk about hard things so that mama doesn't feel judged and doesn't feel that societal stigma that says, oh, you're pregnant, you should be happy. You've got a new baby, you should be happy. We know that's not the case for all women. Um, and now we kind of have some numbers to back it up that it's actually really common for the majority of women to have at least some symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, if not clinically significant. So just again, remembering the importance of psychological safety and in those hard conversations when a mama is maybe sharing something with us that feels big or scary, taking the time to be reflective and not reactive some quick kind of um, strategies for having those conversations, talking about things especially related to suicidal ideation with mamas are to remain calm, to remain curious, um, to normalize the experience that a lot of mamas have these types of thought, to validate mama's feelings and struggles, um, and then to collaborate with your team and to collaborate with the mama about the plan that needs to happen to keep her safe. Um, I, we give this talk to a lot of different professionals and I think sometimes in other arenas, it's really important to, to talk to folks about how, um, how a lot of mamas who go through this have stories about the systems reacting. She says she's having thoughts of killing herself and all of a sudden somebody takes her baby and puts her in the hospital and that's really scary. And I think for my psychiatry colleagues on this call, you all, you all know there are many gradations of suicidal ideation and, and not to just jump to um, a reactive response. Um, but I think it's important for all of us just to remember the importance of that psychologically safe environment for having hard conversations about these topics. Oh, okay, I see Christina sharing. We do have state maternal review committees that review crucial data and Tennessee does have that wonderful. And Christina, I know you've been really active in that. So thanks for your role in our at the state level change. All right, I am honored to 
hand the mic over to a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Matthew Tolliver. He's a um, psychologist in ETSU pediatrics and an integrative behavioral health specialist. And he's gonna talk to you more about what they're doing in, in pediatrics to really bring the disciplines together. Well, thanks so much. It's great to see you all this morning. And thanks to Dr. Moreland for kind of grounding us in those important foundational things about perinatal mental health. Um, so I want to transition a little bit and talk about how, you know, based on what we had just heard, you know, how our multiple disciplines can coordinate to create some clinical pathways to really support these moms that just transcend our silos or our individual departments. Um, in pediatrics, we've realized that obviously we can't do this alone. Um, and so we want to share some pathways and community linkages that we've currently established and also think about how maybe pediatrics and psychiatry might partner together around this. Next slide, please. So at ETSU PEDS, we've had a behavioral health consultant program since 2009. And this just means that behavioral health providers are integrated into the primary care clinic. And we provide brief same day interventions whenever a concern comes up during the visit. So we've developed a number of clinical pathways over the years, including one targeting postpartum depression, which we've been working on since 2013. Next slide. So we realized that actually in our setting, a lot of times moms were coming to their babies well child check in pediatrics while at the same time missing their own OB follow-ups in the floor located just above ours in the same building even. Um, but before we created this clinical pathway I'm gonna talk about, we really didn't have a standardized way to identify and help these families and to even kind of figure out what, what was going on. Um, the pediatric literature in general supports and encourages screening in this setting. And it talks about how it can be an opportune place to identify moms who are struggling. Um, but the question kind of is, you know, okay, once you identify these moms, what do you do then? What are you supposed to do next? And that's something that since 2013, we've been really trying to build and improve and, and increase our collaboration with other stakeholders on. Next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, some of the folks who work in pediatrics and, you know, we've really tried to leverage multiple disciplines around this concern around perinatal mental health that's showing up. We have psychology, we have social work, we've recently integrated in nutrition. Um, of course, we have nursing and medicine and, and our social work team is great at um, increasing and, and finding additional community resources we can link these moms to. Next slide. So as part of our protocol, we chose to screen with the Edinburgh, which you may be familiar with. It's a free uh, screener. It's really quick to administer and score. Um, it's got decent psychometrics and we've really uh, felt like it's been helpful in our setting. It's used in a lot of primary care settings. Uh, next slide, please. So in our pathway specifically, uh, mom gets the Edinburgh at the baby's well child check, every well child check from birth to six months old. And so the physician will score that screener and determine a plan of action. And for the moms who score high, um, I'm able to come in as the behavioral health consultant and our social work team, which we call the resource team, can come and intervene and provide some brief interventions and connection to community resources or outpatient therapy for that mom. Um, and we also attempt to link them back to their OB and or their primary care provider, and sometimes to you all in psychiatry. And uh, we found that really overall moms are, are pretty highly satisfied with this service. And even if we can't address all of their concerns, a lot have said, like, we just appreciate that, um, you know, you've, you've even asked and, and brought this up. Next slide. So in pediatrics, we're able to address a, a good percentage of moms' concerns within this integrated primary care framework, especially the moms who are lower scoring but have some identified stressors. Um, but for a subset of moms, it really takes getting connected into outpatient therapy, 
um, and or getting medicine prescribed by their OB or by their PCP. But really, um, we have the most difficulty, I think, addressing concerns of moms who have pretty complex mental health histories, um, who've been on multiple different psychotropic meds, you know, or who are showing a really high degree of impairment. And we've started to partner with uh, our OB colleagues upstairs, but a lot of times they're not really comfortable managing these moms who have more complex histories or are on multiple medicines. Um, and so Dr. Jay Schenker, uh, who's one of the great pediatricians that I work with in pediatrics, is gonna speak next a little bit about some of the efforts that we're exploring to go beyond pediatrics and connect with other departments to address these concerns. And then at the end, uh, we're gonna talk about a case and see if there might be opportunities for pediatrics and psychiatry to partner together um, to help these moms. Next slide. And I'll let Dr. J take it from there. Wonderful. I realized I had to unmute myself. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here and to share what we've been doing. Um, as Dr. Tolliver very rightly said, um, we realized, well, we're doing this in pediatrics, but it's not just pediatrics. There are several interconnected fields in providers who are all involved in the care of this mom and the infant. And really, we all need to be able to communicate and connect with each other. Next slide, please. So in 2010, and really it was 10 years ago, a clinical report from the American Academy of Pediatrics described the rationale and the need for screening for postpartum depression in pediatric primary care. As you might imagine, when this first came out and my colleagues went to the AAP meeting, um, you know, every year it's in a different place. I think it may have been in San Diego that year or the year after and brought back this mandate saying, guys, we have to start screening for postpartum depression. Um, there was panic amongst us. We were like, we're pediatricians. We've kind of put away those adults. It's been a long time ago. Are you kidding me? You're asking me to screen somebody for what? Depression, suicidal ideation? And then what am I supposed to do with that? Um, so it really was a hard thing for us to wrap our brains around. But um, and according to the 2013 periodic, periodic survey of the AAP members, Really, although they came out with this in 2010, less than half of the pediatricians were screening mothers for depression back in 2013. Now, I can say with some conviction that we've actually come a long way since then. Um, postpartum depression screening is sort of standard practice in pediatrics. There have been many things that have come through the pipeline, including uh, the ability to pay for that screener, which has helped uh, most people get on board with this. And what you see on the screen is the 2019 um, clinical pathway or the recognizing and managing perinatal depression in pediatric practice um, that was put out as a policy, policy statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, as Dr. Moreland very beautifully showed us earlier, untreated postpartum depression can definitely lead to impaired parent-child interactions, um, in pediatrics, we see some of the really bad kind of downstream effects of that, um, discontinuation of breastfeeding often. Um, it can hinder bonding. Um, it can distort perception of the infant's behavior by mom. It can cause the mom to be less sensitive and attuned, can be somewhat more indifferent, or on the other hand, more controlling of the child's behaviors. Um, it can impair mom's attention to and judgment about the health and safety of her child. And because it compromises bonding, the child in turn may be failing to thrive, may withdraw from daily activities. I mean, just downstream, the number of effects that we see are huge. Um, and so we realized as pediatricians that we had to start addressing this. It was something we, you know, it, as she very rightly said, it's a mom baby diet. Um, and we really could not take just the baby uh, without taking the mom in the context of that human. Um, and of course, the whole family in the context of 
um, how the baby was doing. Next slide, please. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines currently are that um, we integrate postpartum depression surveillance and screening at the one month, the two month, the four month, and the six month visits. And as Dr. Tolliver pointed out earlier, we do see these children, you know, moms who may not be as attuned to taking care of themselves or put that on the back burner, do bring the kids in for their shots. They get vaccines at the two, four, and six month mark. Um, when they first had a new baby, they're usually there. They're there at the newborn visit. They come the following week. They come for their breastfeeding check. They come for their weight check. They come for a one month checkup. So we found that we were seeing these kids multiple times and these moms may not have actually made it to their OB where you know um, they could have been assessed for something like this and that we were in the ideal position to assess them. Next slide, please. So then we realized that, well, it's not just pediatrics. We really need to partner with our OB colleagues. Um, depression and anxiety are common in pregnancy and the postpartum period. Dr. Moreland told us um, all about the adverse effects on the mom and the baby about when they have untreated psychiatric illness um, during the pregnancy or soon after the baby is born. Despite this, many women are either undertreated, untreated, or we find that the docs may be hesitant to recommend medications to pregnant or lactating mothers because of lack of knowledge about how safe or not these medications may be. Um, so the American College of Gynecology uh, and Obstetrics in 2018 actually then came out with their own recommendations and have mandated that ob should screen patients at least once during the perinatal period using a validated screener, and then most definitely at the postpartum comprehensive visit. The other thing they did was initially the postpartum visit used to be at the six week mark. They actually now mandate doing a postpartum visit at the two, three week mark, especially in high risk moms, specifically to address this postpartum depression. Um, they do recommend that you screen because screening alone may have clinical benefits. As Dr. Tolliver said, just in the asking, oftentimes that helps these moms. Of course, initiation of treatment and then referral to mental health and getting all of these systems in place and making sure of follow-up really, really in, provides maximum benefit for these mothers. Next slide, please. So then, um, and again, as Dr. Moreland says, you all are the experts, but in looking at the APA literature, um, I see that your body follows the US PS task force, um, and in January 2016, the task force updated its recommendations that in adults, screening for depression should include screening pregnant and postpartum women. Um, the APA also says that in general, the risk of birth defects to the unborn baby are low, and the decision as to whether um, one should start medication for pregnant or nursing moms um, should really be based on careful consideration of the potential risk benefit ratio of treatment versus no treatment, how it might affect the health of the mother, how it might affect the health of the unborn child or of the newborn infant, and really taking that family unit into consideration when making these decisions. Uh, the APA guidelines suggest that in women with major depressive di disorder who are pregnant or breastfeeding, if they have mild depression or anxiety, psychotherapy without medication may be the first line. Um, however, for moderate or severe depression or anxiety, antidepressant medication would be recommended. Next slide, please. And again, you all are the experts on this. Um, we know that there's a number of medications now that people feel fairly comfortable uh, with the safety profile to use either in pregnancy or during lactation. Um, of note for us in pediatrics is um, the association of certain SSRIs uh, with persistent pulmonary hypertension, which could be devastating for the newborn. 
Um, and so certainly thinking about that precaution while prescribing these medications is something uh, that really you all are the experts on. Next slide, please. So further, the APA um, looked at the USPS task force in February of 2019, who updated their recommendations and suggested that clinicians provide or refer pregnant and postpartum women at increased risk of perinatal depression to counseling interventions. So not just treatment, but really kind of encompass that whole thing that you would need for them. Um, Evidence-based treatments, as you all know, would include cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, either in individual therapies or group therapies. Um, also recognizing, importantly, that family, community, and peer support groups uh, may play a big role for these families. Um, as Dr. Moreland very nicely said to us, demystification of the process, normalization of the issue, reducing the guilt and shame of these mamas were all important pieces of the puzzle. Next slide, please. So there are very many, many groups that need to be involved in the care of this family, of the mom and the child. Um, and that brings us to the next part of our presentation. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Christina Delaney. Uh, Christina is an RN and is now going to tell you more about the community supports that we have put into place and are available to your patients. Um, Christina will share her story, um, but what really has impressed me about Christina is how she has taken her story um, to then advocate so strongly for these mamas and these families. Um, and has really been like the pillar of um, our advocacy efforts. Um, and I'm happy to have Christina take it from here. Thank you so much, Dr. Jay Shanker. And it's a pleasure to be here sharing with all of you today. And I just wanna share with you real quick about um, a mom that moved here four and a half years ago that uh, came here to be closer to a supportive network, closer to family after experiencing a very unexpected crisis that landed her in a psych unit for two weeks, five and a half months postpartum. And that was eight months prior to her moving here. Um, she found during that move that uh, navigating a new mental health system was very challenging um, and truly little to no resources were found for her specific condition, which was postpartum psychosis or for moms in general. Um, and that mama was me. Um, I did have postpartum psychosis when I was five and a half months postpartum. I did spend two weeks in a psychiatric unit. It was very scary. Uh, you can find more about my story um, uh, by Googling my name and postpartum psychosis. That is very, it's out there. Um, I've been very vocal about it. Um, it didn't take me very long to do that. Um, but when I moved here um, and found that there were no, hardly any resources for moms, um, it made me want to change that. Uh, being a nurse and wanting to educate people, um, that's what we do. We want to you know, find resources um, for those that are struggling. Uh, it led me to find Dr. Moreland um, and that led me, we then found uh, Dr. Tolliver and uh, we founded this beautiful alliance um, to help change the stigma and uh, change what we were doing in the community. Um, so then we didn't have hardly anything, but now you're gonna see beautiful resources that are now available to um, the clients that you see um, and clients that you uh, serve. So we have the Appalachian Perinatal Mental Health Alliance that uh, Dr. Moreland so beautifully described earlier. Um, and we also have Cherished Mom, which is uh, my organization that I founded. And our mission is to promote awareness and education and support for perinatal mood disorders to moms, families, healthcare professionals, and the community. Um, and you can find our website there and our socials. And we also have uh, the Facebook page and Instagram for the Alliance as well. And we, we call it AMPA or the Alliance for short. Next slide, please. 
And I'm going to hand it back to Diana because mom power is her baby um, and she can explain mom power much better than I can. I will briefly do this. Um, I've given a grand rounds talk on this. So if you want to see the full hour, please feel free to Google that. Um, but mom power is an evidence based um, 10 week group intervention for pregnant and postpartum women with mental health difficulties, trauma histories, and other psychosocial stressors. Um, it's really meant to engage mamas in evidence-based treatment um, and help reduce the barriers to accessing care, such as um, when we're not in a pandemic, childcare, transportation, as well as the psychological kind of safety barriers related to fear, shame, stigmatization, mistrust of systems, et cetera. Um, so, it's, we're starting our, I think our eighth group in the Appalachian Highlands this week. Um, we're all virtual right now, but if you wanna learn more about Mom Power, um, please Google it and or shoot me an email and I'm happy to talk to you. But I just want you to know that's a resource for um, some of the mamas that y'all serve. Thank you, Diana, for explaining that. We also have peer support groups, which um, Dr. Jay Schenker uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, under Cherish Mom, we have a perinatal support group, a NICU support group that is starting next month, as well as an infertility support group. And we are always adding to those. Um, you can find those on our website, um, going to our calendar. Um, and that is another thing that was not present. And most moms that we see are very apprehensive to being on medication or even going to therapy. Um, but once they find this, a supportive network of other moms who understand, um, they find resources and um, go, get, end up going to one or the other and find a modality that works for them. Um, and this list you see on the screen to your right, again, that was a list that didn't exist two years ago. And we are constantly adding to that resource list um, of specialized therapists and counselors, um, dedicated community organization, lactation consultants, providers and professionals, and doulas uh, that are trained specifically in perinatal mental health. Um, there's a disclaimer on the bottom that you probably can't read, but it says that basically we require the two-day training with Postpartum Support International or an equivalent training to be on that list. Um, uh, and we, are, we would love to add to it. And this list has just grown um, in the last year and a half, and we're, we're very um, fortunate to have it. Next slide, please. Uh, national resources and trainings, like I said earlier, the Postpartum Support International training, uh, there's a warm line that is answered by coordinators throughout, this, throughout the nation. Um, we have several in our state. Uh, we actually do not have any specific in our region, um, they're in, closest to us are in Knoxville and Asheville, I do believe, um, but they have access to our resources and know where to send mamas here regionally. Um, there is a psychiatric warm line um, that if you have any issues, you can access that, um, that have psychiatrists available. Um, and of course, the frontline trainings that I mentioned earlier. And the Cellini Institute is another training that is very similar to the frontline training. Next slide, please. And that's the psychiatric consult line that if you uh, are having any, um, any, if you have a, a complicated patient that you need a consult on, you can call that. It's specific to providers. Next slide, please. And this is more training opportunities. Um, we rely on Postpartum Support International so much because they are the nationwide leader in training professionals in perinatal mental health. And so you can go to postpartum.net and go to professionals and find all the trainings there. Uh, a silver lining in the pandemic is that all their trainings are online. Um, so you can get the two-day training very easily if you can find two days to block off your schedule to do it. Um, if not, they partner with 2020 Mom and offer a, a six-month training to do that as well. And there's the Postpartum Stress Center um, that offers training also. Uh, postpartum Psychosis Resources, um, since that is 
my story. That's also a very big passion of mine. Uh, postpartum psychosis, they have coordinators within PSI as well. Michelle Davidson is a survivor and she's now a nurse practitioner. Um, good friend of mine, she lives in Virginia, uh, based out of Virginia Beach, and she is one of the coordinators, so you can find her information there. Um, Massachusetts General Hospital is doing a research project right now, and you can find out all the information there where survivors can um, participate there and also share their stories. And they received a grant uh, where they provide consultation for medical providers uh, that have patients experiencing postpartum psychosis. So you can uh, consult with them directly and that um, Dr. Lee Cohen is uh, the director of that. So um, if any of you know him. And then there's Action, Postpar Action on Postpartum Psychosis, which is based in the UK. Next slide, thank you. And resources for medications in pregnancy and breastfeeding. I won't go through all of those, but there's um, resources if you are in need. And there's more resources. Thank you all. And I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Jay Schenker. Okay. So I really just wanted to bring us all together to tie this all in, um, really to use this as a springboard for your questions um, and to see um, what we can do going forward and how we can move with this. Next slide, please. So. Jessica and Raleigh, you can read the case here, is somebody that I meet on a weekly, if not a daily basis. And I know that several of you all meet when we send them your way to have us help with the mom. Um, I think she portrays all of the difficulties that we have suggested through our talk so far. Um, babies having trouble gaining weight, babies being fussy, mom's not sleeping, mom's crying all the time, mom is young, uh, mom doesn't have a lot of support systems, mom has one maternal grandmother but really doesn't want to stay with her. Um, and then we found out that, hey, mom was actually one of our adolescents and was seen in our adolescent clinic for several years and has a history of being on antidepressant medications prior to this. Um, and when we first started doing this, truly, we were petrified. I still remember, like yesterday, clearly the day when I first got a screener that was a 27, I almost died. Uh, but um, Dr. Tolliver can vouch that we're become, we've become old hand at this now. Um, you know, I will walk into the BHC room and say, oh, it's a 21, and she's a hardly ever, and, you know, it, it really used to panic us that we would have these moms with suicidal intent in our clinic and um, how on earth can we screen them? What on earth do we do? How do we wrap our brain around this? And it seems like slowly but surely we've done, taken steps to try and coordinate and get these things in places for mom. Uh, we partnered with our OB colleagues to send them the screeners. We realized that a lot of our mamas went upstairs to see OB. So we fax the screener after getting a release from mom. So our standard process includes getting that release, faxing the screener to OB. We then try and coordinate and have them see the mom at, on the same day that we see the baby. So we're kind of working on that process. Um, we do know that our OB colleagues, when we presented this to them said, sure, we don't mind starting simple medication, but you know, getting into the complex moms who may be on two or three medications, or who have a prior history of depression, have a lot of psychosocial factors that may impact what we're doing, uh, they really also want more further specialist help. And I think that's where you all come in. So I'm gonna stop talking and see what questions folks have. Feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, I really would like to challenge us to move further with this. How do we work together? What do we do next? Um, what questions do you have after seeing um, what we had to present today? Well, to all of our speakers, thank you so much for this very informative presentation and on, a, on a very important topic. Um, so like Dr. Jay Shankar said, let's open this up to questions. 
and feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, thank you so much for the um, great overview of all of the different aspects. This is clearly a very difficult and complicated area. And I think one of the things um, that I know I stress to residents is there's obviously the most important part of it is taking care of the mom and the baby because they are already a package deal. And then there's the, the broader uh, family and all the other supports who often end up like grandparents are involved in taking care of the person and multiple doctors usually, you know, the OBGYN, the primary care early on, um, the therapist perhaps, the pediatrician um, and others, uh, maybe a psychiatrist. Um, but I think the, the the other aspect of this also is we have to also be very cognizant of this dyad because our liability also is out to 18 years because we are dealing with a, you know, a, a neonate and a, and, a, and a baby. And so we want to be very careful that we are making sure we are providing not only the best care for the mom, but also the best outcome for the baby as well. And you've mentioned, you know, the Mother Risk out of Toronto and Mass General Lee Cohen's group that provide that have done a lot of research in this area of peripartum um, psychiatric disorders, and they have wonderful um, articles, review articles on um, medication treatment and having the consultative role. I think is wonderful, particularly because the, perhaps some of the most serious uh, women who have postpartum episodes are women that have bipolar illness or women that may have psychosis. Now it's very rare to have the psychosis postpartum, but if those have it once, they're gonna have it almost certainly a second time. So I do think it's, it's great that you all brought this very important issue um, to the forefront because we all need to be uh, aware of it. And the other important thing is from a medication standpoint, one needs to stay abreast because it's an always changing field. It's, if you are looking at data from five years ago, you're in many cases um, not, out of date. Um, so I, I just want to emphasize, say thank you for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Chandraya. Um, a question I have is how can we communicate better with each other? Um, after our OB Grand Rounds last year, we actually did lots more um, work with OB and um, have partnered with them a whole bunch more. I think one of the downstream effects has been we have a care coordinator who's now a combined OB peds care coordinator who actually spends part of her time in OB, kind of wraps around services for these moms. And then once the babies are born, as they come um, see us in the clinic, is able to help coordinate some of these pieces. Um, we've actually found that OBs are now screening these moms with a screener before they leave the hospital. And you know we were kind of um, taken aback by it the first time it happened. When the mom came to us, she had a high screener, and lo and behold, her screener had been 21 in the hospital before she left the hospital, um, and had actually had a consult from you all before she ever came to see us. And so we realized that having that knowledge in advance, and maybe having the ability to help wrap services around when she came to our clinic would have been very useful to have known right from the outset. And so we've really worked hard to kind of bridge that communication gap. And so that's what I'd like to hear from you all. How can we, how can we work together on this? I I don't really have the answer to that question, but I wanted to throw in a comment and then go back to your question, which is I want to underscore what Dr. Shandrea said that you really have to keep up with the literature because it's always changing. And so for example, paroxetine is now contraindicated in pregnancy. And so that resource, I loved your resource list. I commend your group for pulling together. I think it's fantastic because I remember when there was nothing like that. And one of my patients that I, worked with the most was a woman who was sort of bitterly angry that her OB doctor didn't listen to her when she started having postpartum depression. And uh, it took her a long time to finally access help. So um, I, I think it's great you have that group, but that Mass General website is a really good resource. 
but I'm retired, so I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. And Miller. One thing I wanted to share was also just for like a quick reference. And again, I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't think I'll ever be the expert on this. But when moms ask me, and we get asked this as a pediatrician all the time, my OB says I should start taking this. What do you think it's safe for me to breastfeed and take it? One thing that I use is actually what we call mommy meds on my phone. So you can search the app mommy meds. Uh, Dr. Hale came and gave us a grand rounds several years ago um, in has done an immense amount of work on the safety of medications. And really, the when you search a medication, it gives you um, the whether the medicine is safe in pregnancy. It gives you like a category risk for pregnancy, for lactation, teratogenic effects, et cetera. It's a really nice app. And so it, it, it's a simple way for me in clinic to keep up with it. It's called Mommy Meds. So it's something that you might look at. What I, I I think that's very important that we have that. One of the things I wanted to highlight is, you know, the FDA no longer uses that FDA categorization anymore. Now what they do is they've got, actually they present the latest data in terms of risks for moms. They are even, for all medications, they're looking at fertility risks on dads and in lactation. So they're actually bringing the men in finally into this area as well, because it affects the baby potentially, you know, or having babies. So that it's important that now we don't we can't rely on the former you know category A B C D kind of risk uh, scenarios. Um, the nice thing, as you know, Dr. Jayashankar, is that the, the Pediatric Academy actually does put out on in, their recommendations on what they say which medications are relatively okay. And you all say that tip you know less than I believe, if I recall correctly, two percent you know in going into the baby is fine. And most medications during lactation, not all, I mean, things like lithium and there are some exceptions, most medications have less than a percent that actually goes into the baby, which is really good from the standpoint of mother-child bonding for at least, um, you know, nursing time. Now, the pregnancy, of course, it varies depending on which semester of the pregnancy we're talking about and the various risks, et cetera, with various medications. But at least I think from a lactation standpoint, I'm always trying to encourage uh, moms to breastfeed for both the psychological and the physiological benefits, barring any specific contraindication in the rare medication. So I'm really glad you brought that up because we all want the best for both the mother and the child. I agree. Yay, breastfeeding. And yes, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we really do. And this is why we would love to know, you know, if we have a mom whom we see, we send them to OB, OB feels like, well, no, this is a little bit more complex. We're going to send you to psychiatry. You end up seeing one of our moms. We would love to partner with you, you know, and have a shared conversation and understanding of, um, you know, what do you feel is best for the mom and the baby? How, what do we feel? How can we support them? How can we help, you know, um, make this the best outcome for both of them um, in I know some, many years ago when they first told us about EHR, they had this utopian world where everybody would be able to see everybody else's notes and, you know, it would be this combined beautiful world where we can see what's going on. But we all know in practice, it's like you could be in the same group, ETSU Pediatrics here and ETSU Pediatrics in the hospital across the street don't share notes and don't have the same EHR. and don't have the same version of the EHR and the EHRs don't talk to each other. So oftentimes we're limited by some of those, you know, disadvantages that we, we know exist. Um, we had, and Dr. Tolliver, do you want to tell us about how we partnered with one of the community mental health agencies to be able to send referrals and get kind of a feedback? One thing uh, is that uh, working with Dr. Musil and kind of Frontier too in the past, they had we had developed this referral line, kind of dedicated line that we use with them to refer some moms and they get us feedback about uh, whether or not they showed up or when their appointment was or, or that kind of thing to, to try to streamline that um, service and, and know that they're able to get connected in with counseling and potentially med management. And the thing I like about that is they actually call us and say, this mom did not show up. 
And so then we end up saying, oh, the mom didn't show up. I'm really worried about this mom, you know, and oftentimes we have the knowledge whether that mom may have a CPS worker, may have maybe involved with Families Free or another community agency. Um, we're actually, we've got a special multidisciplinary clinic to going for our um, NAS babies and moms right now through our clinic. Um, and so we're able to kind of access other services to try and reach this family and these moms. So would love to see how we can partner with you all to make the communication better. And I, I would see a great educational opportunity for the, the residents to be involved in that through our outpatient clinic. I am, I, I know in my outpatient um, experience, I haven't had any perinatal uh, patients. And so I think that that's definitely an area for um, exposure, for increased exposure, for sure. I think definitely we should continue the conversation and keep this going on the table so that we can get together more. I think it does. Uh, you bring up a great point, Dr. Jensen. It brings up great opportunity um, from a resident standpoint, also for academic presentations, for kind of collaboration um, that would be very, very helpful, I think, as you all go through. So um, we've had you know, several of our residents involved in the process piece with our Edinburgh screening and, um, you know, with, with what we did with that, uh, where we took it to national and local and regional meetings and presentations. So I think it would be great. Would love to hear who's interested. Um, I will put my email in the chat box um, and as will all of us as presenters and we would love to have you reach out to us. Let's keep the conversation going. Would love to hear what your interests are and you know how we can move this along. Yeah, thank you very much. It was awesome, thank you. Thanks. Thanks everybody for joining us. It was an honor to get to spend some time with y'all. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Great job. Thanks.